In this video, we're going to talk about the brand new RevaPoint Morocco 3D scanner, so stay tuned. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we're going to be looking at this brand new RevoPoint Morocco 3D scanner. Now, full disclosure, they did send this to me, so consider this a paid promotion. However, the only thing I'm really required to tell you about this is that it's part of a new Kickstarter campaign. Now, the information for that is going to be in the description of the video, and I'm not going to be doing an entire walkthrough on how to use this unit in this video. But instead, I want to focus on what this is, give you some of the specs, kind of my opinion, and then we'll look at some examples of its scanning. So first things, what is this? Well, this represents a big shift in the RevoPoint lineup, but it also is something that's not very common in the 3D scanning market at all. I think there's one other scanner that's on the market that does something similar, but this is everything you need. You don't need a laptop with you. You don't need to be tethered to a computer. You just simply take this unit with you and 3D scan. So that alone is something that is extremely powerful. Being able to just take this with you, maybe take the charging cable and 3D scan, that has an amazing value proposition. But the second thing is that everything that you can do in RevoScan on the computer, you can do in here. So once you capture a scan and once you get mesh data in, all the processing can happen directly in here from taking the points and fusing them, doing some cleanup, creating your mesh, and even doing the RGB texturing, all that happens directly in this unit with the touchscreen. Now it can be tethered to a computer via Wi-Fi or with a USB-C, but the ability to work with the mesh and the points directly inside of this unit is a huge advantage. And the next thing, or the third thing that sort of sets this apart is the fact that it encompasses multiple different scans. So what I mean by that is if you take a look at the RevoPoint lineup, you've got the Mini, which is intended to scan smaller objects, and you've got at the very top end the range for larger objects. Now, when you go from a smaller object scanner to a larger object scanner, the precision and the accuracy tends to drop. So that's kind of the same thing here, but we now have the ability to toggle between modes. So when we're using it for near scanning, for example, the single frame precision is 0.02 millimeters. When we switch to far mode and we're talking about objects further than, let's say 600 millimeters away, then it goes to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters, which you would expect out of a scanner that is looking at doing distances that far away. The fact that we can toggle back and forth between those in a single scanner is something that is very impressive. So I don't know, technically speaking, if they are exactly the same as the Mini and the Range series, but the specs are very similar. So I would consider this as a handheld, all-encompassing Mini and Range in one unit. It also does have a 48 megapixel RGB camera, so it does the colors and textures, and again, all that is built directly in. It has a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, and that claims to go for about two hours. Now this unit does also include the ability to do screen recording directly on the unit. So when you transfer that project to a computer, you'll get a video file in addition to all the mesh projects. Now I've used it for an hour doing scanning and screen recording and only used up about 25% of the battery. And today I've used it for several hours and I've only had to plug it in once. So I think that you can get more than two hours out of it, but obviously it's gonna be dependent on what you're doing whether or not you're using the near or the far options, whether or not you're capturing RGB or doing screen recording. But the charger that comes with it can get back up to 85% in about 30 minutes. So if you're scanning and you get down around 20, 30% battery, you can get it back up to 100% pretty quickly. So um, amazing benefit to be able to just take this and not carry a cart and a laptop or a computer and all the other things that you need to take with you to do 3D scanning. With this unit, uh, it also does have a built-in 2.4 gigahertz eight-core processor. I've seen specs for RAM at 16 and 32. I think there may be some different models available. 
And it also has a lot of onboard memory. I think it's got over 200 gigs of free memory. So you can really store a lot of data on this in terms of screen capture video, as well as information that you're capturing when point clouds and mesh. And all of that can be done directly on this unit. The screen is helpful if you do um, you know, face or person scanning. It does flip 180 degrees on screen, so that way you can just hold it in front of you and scan yourself. So again, amazing benefit to be able to do that. So now that we know a bit about the Miraco, let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of using it. So first I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the screen. I'm just gonna to toggle on screen recording. And the first thing that we notice is it looks very much like RevoScan's desktop software. And that's by no accident. Everything that we can do there, we can do here, but there are some new additions. So when we take a look at the screen, the top left, we've got auto exposure, which we can toggle on and off. We can sort of um, change the background and the brightness. We also have a far and a near mode. So again, this changes which sensors we're using. When we go to the far mode, we're talking about objects that are between 300 and 1200 millimeters away. When we're looking at the near mode, we're between 120 and 300 millimeters, somewhere in that range. In the bottom left, we've got our RGB camera view. Uh, and again, auto options, we can toggle on and off the brightness. As I mentioned, it does have a flash built in. Uh, you can also swipe this to the, um, the left if you want more area here, and then we can bring it back. On the top, we've got a little bar that kind of tells us if we're too far or too close. So it really helps in terms of making sure that we're capturing the best possible data. Remember on the near mode, we're looking at a single frame precision of 0.02 millimeters. So if we're looking at capturing an object, we look at all of our settings. We've got disable and hide surfaces, which will cut a ground plane if it sees it. We've got options to toggle on the clipping. We can toggle on and off the RGB camera. And we also have the option to sort of recenter our view. So if things are out, I'm gonna go ahead and add a new scan to this. And I'm gonna use a continuous mode first. There's a play button on the top, but we've also got one on the screen here. And all you simply need to do is just make sure that you're staying a good distance away and just work around your object like you would with any other scanner. I'm not gonna capture the whole thing. So we're gonna go ahead and hit stop. And then we can zoom in, we can review. Make sure that we've captured our data. We could position it, add another scan to it. We also have the option to do a single shot and the single shot will be a single frame and we can go ahead and capture a single frame and just review what we've captured. Now, generally the single frame will be the highest possible accuracy and precision that we can get. And this is a great option because in single frame mode, we can move it and we can use the play button on top and we can continue capturing more. And really what we want is we wanna look at roughly 60% overlap between the scans. Um, so that way it's able to do the auto alignment. And you can see that just really quickly, we were able to capture multiple areas of that controller. So again, in here, we can go back and forth between continuous and single shot, but we also have the option to determine whether or not we're doing standard or high accuracy, feature or marker alignment. We've got some object type options, which we're gonna take a look at a dark object when we get out and, and scan a bicycle frame. And we can toggle on or off whether or not we're capturing that RGB data. Now, all of these, when we add scans, are gonna be captured inside of a project. That entire project can be tethered with Wi-Fi or with the USB-C directly to a computer, or it'll be saved on here and then we can migrate it using file transfer later. So what I'm gonna do is just capture a couple more frames. Maybe move up just a little bit, up just a little bit more, and then we're gonna stop the capture. So now, since we've colored the RGB data, it knows with the points that they're different colors, and it'll be able to apply that texture and color map later when we move on to the meshing stage. Now, with that said, once we're done with the scan, we can go back in and view all the scans so now I've got nine in this project of the controller and we can move on to doing fusion, which means that we're taking the individual points and taking a look at the point distance and then we're gonna put them together as a single point and we can go through the entire process. So 
with this, we also have editing abilities. So we can select and we can delete certain areas. We can rotate the model. I can use the lasso tool again and delete. And once we're done, we just simply hit back and we can go back in and do isolation or overlap detection or smoothing out the points, anything that you would see inside of the RevoScan software. Then when we're done, we can move on to meshing. Everything can be done completely in here. And as I mentioned, I'm not gonna go through the entire process. Meshing a point cloud takes a bit of time, whether it's on here or if it's on the computer. So I don't think it's worth taking a look at that. But anything that can be done in RevoScan can be done here. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the model hub. We've got all these different projects, different scans inside of an individual project. We can decide if we wanna keep or delete any of them. So we can capture a bunch of data, maybe get rid of that one, maybe get rid of this one. And only keep the ones that are good. So all that happens directly in here. Uh, as I mentioned, information about storage, Wi-Fi, general settings, so over-the-air software updates, information about the battery level. Right now we're at 63%, and I've been using this for about the last hour and a half. It's been on that entire time. And I've been doing screen recording and some mesh capture. So um, again, we could get over two hours out of that battery, but it just kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, I think that the overall layout and process of how you capture data with this is really well refined. It is not ideal to do a lot of this with touchscreen, but it is possible. So cleaning up a point cloud or cleaning up a mesh can be done here. I do think that there's still a lot of value in taking it to the computer. This weighs about a pound and a half, so it's not overly heavy. It's something that's easy to handle, especially if you're using two hands. So it's easy to carry. It's not super cumbersome, like if you were using a larger scanner and you had to hold the cable and sort of move it around and support it with just one hand. It can become very tiring, especially when you have to hold it over objects and move it around. So um, I think that the weight is right on par with uh, the battery and everything that's built into it. I think it works pretty well. So we've seen a basic look at how this works. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen recording. But now that we've seen a basic look, let's take a look at a couple of examples so we can understand how it works in different situations. So this first example is an RC truck. Now, I use this one because of the object size, but also the fact that it's got shiny red plastic, shiny black plastic, and matte black, as well as the rubber tires. We can really see what gets picked up and what doesn't. On the shiny black, it's just not picking up anything except for, in some cases, around the stickers, it's picking those up. But this is what you would expect, and very few 3D scanners will actually capture that. Um, so it's not a knock in any way on this scanner. It's just something that you commonly have to adjust for when you're 3D scanning. This next object was the bar clamp that we used as a reverse engineering part in a couple of different videos. This one has flat gray primer spray paint on it, so it's a decent candidate for picking up detail but the corners and edges are pretty shiny. The paint doesn't stick to those edges. Using it on a turntable in the near mode so we get the highest single frame precision actually does a pretty good job. So it captures the data exactly like we would expect. This is a decent candidate for us to do single shot, but the problem is it is symmetric from left to right. So we are going to have a problem aligning all of those different scans together. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at, we're going to start to take a look at bigger objects. So here we have a bike frame, and the bike frame has sort of a matte finish on it, and it's white and dark blue. Now the dark blue section doesn't get picked up in the normal scanning mode, but when we use the dark option, it actually does a really good job of capturing that data. All right, the next thing that we looked at is the Mitsubishi Starion. Now this was part of other scanning series. It still has marker dots all over it. And it has way too many, which we know from previous series. But I was actually really impressed with how the Morocco scanner handled this. Now, with the marker dots, it's a little bit tricky because the ones I have on have a pretty small reflector. And I found that this was really critical of the angle between the scanner and those reflectors. The ones that came with it are larger, and it was a little bit more lenient about the angle relative to the, the marker dots. 
So keep that in mind. But I think that it actually did really well with feature scanning over the marker scanning. Now I scanned the hood, I scanned the bumper, I did a corner of the bumper, and I also did the entire fender in one shot. All four of those together were under five minutes. Uh, so it's pretty impressive when you're trying to scan big objects, especially things like car fenders. But I did use marker dots in that case. Which brings me to a couple of other examples. I did a bicycle helmet. I played around with other cars as well as interiors. The bicycle helmet was sort of a, a matte finish as well, a white and a, like a blue gray. And it scanned this really well. I did it with the near and the far modes, did some single shots, and all of these turned out really well. I thought that the quality of the scan was pretty good. With the cars, the exteriors outside did not work. Now, of course, we're talking about shiny vehicles, no prep. So if you are considering this kind of scanner, if you're trying to scan cars, you really do need to consider some scan prep spray. It's gonna be the best way to go forward, and hopefully the feature alignment will work for you. When we're talking about interiors, I played around with a couple different cars. Here are some clips from uh, scanning the inside of my truck. The truck is black interior, black, um, black seats, black trim, everything inside of it is black. And it did about what you would expect. Anything that was textured, the dash is sort of a low gloss texture. Pick that up great. When you're talking about any of the shiny bits, absolutely not. It's gonna need some sort of prep to capture that. But that is not something that you can fault the scanner for. That's gonna be pretty much across the board except for some very specific scanners that can actually pick up on that kind of data. Um, I did some other things. I scanned a rim that is sort of a, a matte finish aluminum. It did great with that. And again, I played around with it with a bunch of different little bits and pieces. And I think that in general, if you're considering backing the Kickstarter campaign, you need to think about what you currently have and if this is gonna be a replacement for it. For me, if I had a mini and I had a range or an Inspire, you're really not gonna get much more functionality out of this than you would with those two scanners. But the exception to that is everything's built into this single unit. So you can do all the scanning without being tethered to a computer or doing a screen mirror on a, on a cell phone. You can just take this with you, do the processing directly on the screen if you need to. And that is gonna be the big benefit with this unit. So if you're looking to purchase a 3D scanner and you don't have anything currently, or maybe you just have a mini, but you don't have a range and Inspire or a Pop 2 or 3, then this will certainly add some functionality, but really the big benefit is the all-encompassing processing unit. Um, now, I will say that, again, I was impressed when I scanned the car fender because I was able to capture that with relatively little trouble the entire fender in under a minute. So the hood took a bit longer, the, the front bumper took a bit longer because those are things where you have to really roll around and, and, and kind of get the angle right. But the fender was relatively quick. So that was super impressive for me. Uh, so for me, if I'm gonna be going into the garage and I wanna scan stuff like bikes or transmissions or things like that, uh, there's a lot of benefit in this unit. So I think I've told you hopefully enough if you have any questions on this or any of the other scanners in the RevoPoint lineup, leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer that. As I mentioned before, I did put a question into the RevoPoint team about anybody that's back the Inspire, if there's gonna be any sort of benefit for them, maybe a discount or something like that. I don't have any word on that yet, but if I do, I will let you know. And what do you wanna see with this? If you wanna do future videos, once these are in consumers' hands, what would you like to see? Do you wanna do a full walkthrough where we process the mesh and work on a part, or do you really not need much? Cause it's pretty self-explanatory. So, but as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.